Good morning. And welcome to this uh, Sunday after Easter, which still means you have to come to church. And so I'm glad you're all here. Um, And for those of you watching at home, we're glad you are with us as usual this week also. We have a special Sunday this morning because we have a wonderful baptism of one of our own. I can't really claim her, but you all can. Um, So we are so excited for the baptism of baby Lily. Are there announcements you have for one another this morning? As I was saying, I feel like I'm a little off this morning, so... So once this changes, there we go, we'll get back on track. So we have lots of special flowers today, and I would call your attention to the bulletin about for whom all of the flowers have been given. These were given by Christine Phelps in honor of her grandson who passed away. And of course, the beautiful lectern families are given for Lillian Batchelder, her namesake. A reminder about the sewing club, if you have um, items you'd like to donate, um, this is your last chance, so bring them into the office or let us know that you have them available. Uh, The special needs support group is this Thursday, so again, if you're um, interested or know any parents who would like to be, please let them know. A reminder to contact Joy Cutter if you are interested in receiving long distance healing at this on the second Sunday of the month or any other time. We will be having our membership class in person and on Zoom on May 2nd at 515. Um, I have a list of folks that are interested in joining and or interested in finding out more about us. So uh, we hope folks will come um, and at least find out and decide then. The fair breakfast is going to be May 14th from 7 to 10. You can see Jan or Chuck. They're still looking for volunteers, and they'll be looking for lots of hungry people that morning also. On May 15th, those people who decide to join the church will be joining uh, during worship. And I know Nancy had an announcement this morning. Trying to find her. Are there other announcements this morning? Go ahead, Al, while she's coming up. You too. Can you turn it on? Veterans would then have to go into Connecticut or 
Thank you, Nancy. Yes, Bruce. Thank you. Good idea. I will call your attention again to the insert in the bulletin. Contact the people that it mentions. I know there's a lot of information there, but read it to yourselves and share it with your neighbor quietly. Um, as we prepare to pass the peace of Christ this morning, the sign of the baptism is the sign of the cross. And although this has become almost a warding off symbol, let us use it instead as a welcoming symbol. The early Christians used to draw a fish in the sand so they would know they had found one another. Let us, as we pass the peace, offer the sign of the cross this morning. The peace of Christ be with you. Let us pass the peace of Christ to one another. And actually, before he starts, I'm going to confess that two weeks ago I hurt my knee and I thought it was better. I wore heels till I got here. I'm going to be preaching and stocking feet, so... We'll get that moment over with now. I'll confess. The word of God is calling. <laughs> All right. Sorry, I had to. Good morning, and please join me in our call to worship. Though darkness seems to envelop us, Jesus, Jesus breaks, breaks through the word with a word of peace. Of peace. Fears are banished. Hope is more than restored. Rejoice. The Lord is with us. We rejoice, rejoice in the peace, peace and, and blessings, blessings he brings. Amen. Amen. Let us join together in our opening hymn, The Day of Resurrection, number 192 in the Red Hymnal. Let 
Let us stand. invite you to stay standing for the invocation. Please join me in our invocation and then following with the Lord's Prayer. Gracious Lord, Easter, Easter was, was such, such a, a high, high point. point. We, we walked, walked through the, the weeks, weeks of Lent and then, then boldly marched with Jesus into Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Our, our steps, steps hesitated and faltered during Holy Week, Week when we, we ate with, with our Lord and then, and then ran, ran from his crucifixion. It was, it was so hard for us to really believe in the miraculous event of Easter when our beloved Lord was raised from the dead. We, like Thomas, wonder if it was real or something made up from desperate longing. Help us to listen to your words with our hearts and our ears. Remind, Remind us that, that the Lord brings his peace to us, us all. We pray and this in, in Jesus' name, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And, and lead us not into temptation, but, but deliver us, us from evil. evil. For thine is the kingdom, and, and the power, and, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. This is an exciting moment for our church, and I'd like to invite Joy Cutter to come forward on behalf of the deacons. And then I'd like to invite Nicole and Jeff and Lillian and your family to come forward as well. Yeah, you should have them stand on this side. You should have them.
<laughs> so, come on up. Why don't you guys come right there and you'll make room for your family. You can stand on the other side if you want. <laughs> There you go. Friends, we are blessed. We are blessed at this moment to celebrate the baptism of Lillian Elizabeth Fredrickson, and we give thanks to God for this precious gift of life. In Scripture, we hear how children were being brought to Jesus so that he might touch them. Jesus told his disciples, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes not only me, but the one who sent me. The sacrament of baptism is an outward and visible sign of the grace of God. It is the promise of new life when we give ourselves and or our children to Christ. Baptism with water and the Holy Spirit is the mark of acceptance into the care of Christ's church, the sign and seal of our participation in God's forgiveness and the beginning of our growth into full Christian faith and fellowship. And now I ask the promises of the two of you. Do you, Nicole and Jeff, desire to baptize your child into this faith and promise to do all that you can to teach your daughter so that she may be led to follow Jesus in her life? If so, please say, I do. Do you promise, by the grace of God, to be Christ's disciple, to show love and justice, and to live a life of faith as best you are able? If so, please say, I promise with the help of God. Do you also promise, according to the grace given you, to grow with your child in the Christian faith, to help this child to be a faithful member of the Church of Jesus Christ by celebrating Christ's presence, by furthering Christ's mission in all the world, and by offering the nurture of the Christian Church so that she may affirm her baptism when she reaches the years of decision? If so, please say, I promise, with the help of God. Now I have a promise that I need to ask of the godparents. You, Lillian's godparents, have also brought your godchild here today to be baptized into this faith. In so doing, do you freely accept your responsibility to help raise Lillian in the faith, to teach her to love God and neighbor through the example of your own lives? And do you promise to support Nicole and Jeff in all to which they have committed themselves? If so, please say, I do. Now we'd like to invite the candlelighters, who are the the grandparents, to go forward. And if you can just separate, we'd like to invite you to go up and take the candlelighter from this table. There's one right here. Go ahead. And there should, is there another one right there? Sorry, there should be two. There you go. And as the grandparents take the light from the Christ candles on the altar, they will each light them symbolizing the journey and the support from which Lillian comes. And then they will come and light this one candle together a light of hope and promise for this new and precious life and for their commitment to care and support this family. Thank you. Now, as representatives of this church, will the members who are able please rise and join me in our congregational covenant. Which one? This? Yeah. Into our fellowship of, of faith, faith, we, we receive, receive Lillian, Lillian Elizabeth, Elizabeth Fredrickson. We, we promise to provide for her a school, school of Christian, Christian learning, learning, a personal concern for her spiritual welfare, welfare and an example of charity and devotion. May God's Holy Spirit so guide us that we may offer to you, both parents and child, our love and support.
May I take her? I put you on the other side. Oh, you lost it. Uh oh. Yes. You can have it back. Yes. By what name shall your child be called? Lillian Elizabeth Fredrickson, I baptize you in the name of the God who created you, of Christ, who has been your example and teacher and will be throughout your life, and of the Holy Spirit, who lives and moves among you. You are a child of God. Amen. <laughs> Let us pray together. We are gathered, O oh God, family and friends, to celebrate the baptism of Lillian. We thank you for the sacred privilege of being able to be parents, grandparents, godparents, aunts and uncles, and through this congregation, teachers and friends. Guide and bless Nicole and Jeff in their parental responsibilities and faith as they grow in faith May their daughter also know your presence in her life. Guide the godparents and us friends that we may be good examples, teachers, and instruments of joy and faith to Lillian and to all the children you bring to us. Amen. I invite us now, as we greet the family, you will also have a chance to greet Lillian as we sing together, Child of Blessing. Child of Promise. Congratulations, and I'm going to go introduce her. Congratulations. Congratulations. I get to steal her for a minute. Thank you. And she didn't freak out with the water. Nice to meet you. <laughs> yes, we're going to walk. Child of blessing, child of promise, baptized with the Spirit's sign, a daughter of his giver, unto love and grace divine. pictures of all of you up here. We'll recreate that. And I guess I have to give her back. I know, and the water, the water was good. I guess I have to give her back. <laughs> okay. There you go. Thank you, and you may be seated.
difficult jumping back and forth place to place. I think that was an epic fail of the James Bond move, Jason. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. Can't help myself. <laughs> That's okay. I'll just remember when it's your turn to do this. Okay. It'll be my turn. I think you're <laughs> So all kidding aside, our scripture reading this morning comes from John chapter 20 verse 19 through 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had been were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails, and with my hand in his side, I will not believe. <laughs> A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were still shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God and that through believing you may have life in his name. May God bless the reading and the hearing of the word. So one time, as used to be a custom, a young couple had been to church and they had invited their elderly pastor over later in the day for dinner. While they were having dinner, the pastor was sitting at the table with the young little boy, sort of chatting back and forth with him, and he said, hey, do you happen to know what we're having for dinner? And the little boy said, goat. Goat? The, the Pastor replied, are you sure? Oh, I'm sure. On the drive home from church today, Mom said to Dad, don't forget, we're having the old goat over for dinner tonight. <laughs> this morning's story, this scripture story about doubt may be familiar to many of you. But even if it's not, I suspect most of you have heard the expression, Doubting Thomas. In today's vernacular, a Doubting Thomas is sort of a skeptic, someone who struggles to believe something without concrete proof, or perhaps someone even who refuses to believe in spite of basic evidence in front of them. Thomas's doubt story, and his doubt in the story occurs because he misses the first encounter with Jesus. All the other disciples were together when Jesus appeared to them, but Thomas was not there. 
So they come to him and say, guess what? We have seen Christ. We have seen him and he's alive and he is back with us. And Thomas says, really? And let's be honest. How many of us would have said, hey, cool, you saw Jesus back from the dead? Wouldn't most of us have been skeptical? Wouldn't most of us wanted, want to have seen for ourselves? But what's interesting in this story, and what I've always found interesting, is that Jesus doesn't question why Thomas wants to see proof. Jesus understands that he wants to see the actual scars. And Jesus goes on to use this moment as a teaching experience, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. But first, he willingly offers up his wounded hands and shows Thomas the wound in his side. And I think that action and Thomas's need to see the actual scars is worth thinking a little bit more about. In our world today, when we think about scars, I think we think about two different types. First, we think of perhaps the technical Webster definition of a scar which is a mark left on the body where a wound has not healed completely. I suspect there are very few of us who don't have at least one tiny little scar somewhere on our bodies. Last Sunday, I talked about my neighbor riding my tricycle over my beloved doll. Well, that tricycle was part of another bad memory too, because one time I fell off that bike in the road at the end of that long driveway and ended up on some broken glass. Again, I went crying down that driveway. Can you tell what I remember is the long driveway? I only lived there till I was five. And I got there, blood streaming down the knee and my mother perched me up on the sink and cleaned up my knee and took out the little glass shards. To this day, I have a little scar reminding me of that moment. I'm sure many of us have those little scars. Perhaps some of you also have larger ones from gallbladder surgery or heart surgery or cesarean births or hip replacements. And all of our scars naturally remind us of one experience or another. Some of these scars serve up pleasant memories, perhaps. Some of them argue that for them, I know for my daughter, a scar is always a badge of honor. Some scars, for some of us, are mysteriously present. They appear and we really don't have any idea what we did to make that happen. Though they may be small, insignificant, barely visible, we still wish on occasion that we could figure out how they happened. But how do we feel about these scars? A rare few of us, as I mentioned, are proud of certain scars, maybe because of the story behind how we got them or how we brought a beautiful baby into this world. Most people, however, aren't pleased with their scars. When they're in places that others might see them, our temptation is to try to cover them up. We hide them with makeup or longer clothes or a carefully placed scarf. But that wasn't Jesus' approach. Jesus knew that his scars revealed not only his struggle and his pain, but his scars revealed his very identity. His scars told a part of his story. And he knew that in this moment, his scars offered proof. Proof of his wounds, proof of his identity, proof of his resurrection. And Thomas needed all of that proof. And I suspect we do as well. In fact, I know we need proof of other scars maybe even more than we should. Now, I don't mean that I need to see your post-surgery scar to believe you need a pastoral care visit in the hospital. If you want to show me, I can handle it, but that's not necessary. I believe that it happened without being shown, but those are not the only kinds of scars that we humans have. Perhaps the most difficult scars to deal with are those scars that are not visible to the human eye. Those scars which mark instead the surface of our heart, making it rough or jagged and uncomfortable to touch. The scars I speak of are the ones we mostly would like to forget about. 
They're the ones we wish we could remove entirely, but we cannot, at least not that easily. And I'm referring, of course, to those emotional scars. And what are those? Those are the lasting effects of unpleasant physical or emotional experiences. The origins of those scars lie in stories left untold, actions sometimes left undone. Things which we, in part, may have been responsible for, and things for which other people need to be held accountable. Those scars can be the result of trauma, or fear, or addiction, or anything in the past that we still carry around as a weight around our necks and that continues to affect our behavior and our actions. So my question today is, do we treat these kinds of scars the same way we treat physical ones? I don't think so. If someone tells us they once fell off their bike or slipped in their sock feet like I did a couple weeks ago and landed on my knee, we believe them. We don't look at them askance and judge whether they want to ride the Elevet this week or take their shoes off to preach, which wasn't part of the sermon, but uh, it seems to be, or take off our heels to go up and down the stairs. Whether they have a physical scar or not, we need to offer accommodation, at least for the time being, and we don't ask for proof when it's a physical issue. But if someone tells us they have a fear, or they don't want to be in a certain situation, or they cringe or duck unexpectedly at a loud noise, or panic if someone raises their voice, or won't eat vegetables, or is afraid of going to the grocery store or out in public alone, we don't immediately accept that an emotional scar is present. We want proof, proof that justifies their response to something that is a little different from ours. And when we are compassionate people, once we hear that story, once we understand why someone feels this way, then we begin to accept their truth. Basically, many humans need proof of the emotional scar before we offer them the grace they really need. I suspect that God in God's infinite wisdom knew and knows that that's part of our human condition. And maybe that is part of the, why this interaction between Thomas and Jesus was told over and over again and finally written down by John. We naturally assume this passage is about faith, and it is. But I think it's about faith in God and faith in each other. Blessed are those who have seen and yet have come, have not seen and yet have come to believe. These are the words that we hold on to from this story. These words encourage Thomas, the guy who missed Jesus' first appearance, and it went on. This phrase went on to encourage those early Christians who missed Jesus' life and teaching by mere moments, weeks, or months. They continue. These words continue to encourage us who live today because the fact is we have not, many of us have not seen Jesus and yet we believe. And we people of faith are not wiser, we're not better than anybody else. But I do think there are moments when we just might be a little bit happier. Why? Because people are happier when we believe truly believe that good is stronger than evil, that love is stronger than hate, despite all that we see in our world that suggests the opposite. Thomas didn't just believe what the disciples told him. He didn't just believe what his heart most wanted to hear and what his good friends and companions on the journey shared with him. He didn't accept their version, their truth. He had to see before he could believe, just like we do. The challenge Jesus set before folks then and us now, however, is to find a way to believe even though we haven't seen. Those scars that Jesus freely showed to the disciples were proof, proof that he was indeed human and that on earth 
He had painful struggles just like all of us will have. None of us, not even Jesus, is immune. Jesus also shows his scars as a way of signaling to us that throughout time, every one of us will have some painful experience in varying degrees. And if we work hard and choose to, we can be transformed by those experiences, just as Jesus was transformed. Pain and suffering often make us cautious. But if we dig deep, they don't have to make us embittered for the rest of our lives. Just like we may have a reaction to our physical scars, for example, having fallen from a tree and fractured a limb, we may have a phobia of heights. Or if we also, we may have a, a fear based on an emotional scar. We may develop fears about loving or trusting or feeling or giving or forgiving. The disciples that day had resigned themselves to a secret room. They were huddled in fear. They had withdrawn into themselves in their own little closed group. In shame, yes, for how they had acted, but in fear that they might be next. Their fear drew them together but apart from the rest of the world. But then Jesus showed up. And Jesus' presence with them brought a whole new perspective. For one thing, his very presence suggested hope. All was not lost, including their faith. The fact that he willingly came and showed them his scars was an indication to them that he understood their nervousness and he held no grudge against what had gone before. And the way he spoke to them, offering them peace, confirmed his never-ending love for each of them. The Easter message is about resurrection. It's about new life. It's about restored hope. That's why this season is so special to us. And that's why we look forward to this period year after year, because it's a fresh reminder. It's a fresh reminder to us of what God is capable of doing, of the far-reaching effects that God's love can have in our lives and in our world. We celebrate when we hear the news that even the scars on our hearts can be healed in time and with great love. On this Sunday after Easter, let us pray that we will find ways to be more accepting of the scars of others, those we see and those we cannot see. And let us pray that our own inner scars will begin to heal just enough that the Easter message can get through to us, and that our pasts, instead of remaining festering wounds, will become positive scars on our hearts. Proof, proof of the lives we have lived, the people we have loved, and the faith we hold dear. Amen. as we prepare to come together in prayer. I will ask if there are joys or concerns folks lift to wish, wish to lift up this morning. Certainly prayers for Lillian and her family on her baptism. Continued prayers for Jen Broughton, who successfully came through surgery this week and who is facing another surgery tomorrow. So prayers for Jen. Are there others this morning? Yes, Helene. Prayers for Sue Pirro, who is battling cancer. Yes, Al.
Not in the last day or so. Prayer she, yes. And prayers for Al, who's having his second cataract surgery this week. <laughs> it's nothing, but we'll still pray. Yes, Diane. Continued prayers for Jim Wasner, who is back in the hospital and possibly facing back surgery on Wednesday. Absolutely. And continued prayers for Alice as well, who is doing better, um, but still struggling at home. Yes, Pamela. Prayers for Jay Dean, who isn't feeling well right now. Thank you. Are there? Yes, Jan. Prayers for Jerry Noyes, who isn't feeling well today and is also working through a couple of medical issues. So prayers for him as well. And let us come together now, first in the time of silence and then in a prayer of the people. Let us be together in prayer. <clears throat> Loving and gracious God, <clears throat> we give you thanks for the joy of a new life among us, for the joy of Lillian, returning and living among us in a new life, in a new way. We celebrate her family, baby Lillian's family, her parents, the godparents, the grandparents, and all of the friends who will support and be part of her life as she grows and learns to live and love in faith. We pray, O oh God, with thanksgiving that Steve is continuing to make progress. Prayers for Al as he faces his not a big deal surgery. We pray for Jen with thanksgiving that she came successfully through the first surgery. And we pray for strength for her body and her spirit and for Duncan by her side as she goes through yet another surgery tomorrow. We pray, O oh God, for Sue, who is battling cancer, for Sue, who is continuing to struggle with infection and breathing issues, for Alice, for Jay, for Jerry. We pray for Jim as he is back in the hospital struggling and that he will be strong enough to face the surgery he needs on Wednesday. Loving and gracious God, when we lift up all these people to you whom we know are struggling, help us be reminded that we are the ones who need to reach out, that we are the ones who are here now, tangibly offering our hands and our hearts to those in need. And we pray as well, O oh God, for our world, for the people of Ukraine, for the people who have welcomed those who have fled. And we pray, O oh God, for peace, that there will be an end to fighting and a return to the peaceable kingdom you so desire. Be with us, O oh God, as we seek to bring that about in your world. Fill others' hearts as well as our own. Loving and gracious God, in all times and all places, we lift our prayers to you. And we pray as always, though we already know the answer, we pray that you hear the prayers of your people. Amen. As we now prepare to collect the morning offering, I invite us to think of the gifts we have been given and to give freely as we are able. Let us collect the morning offering.
gracious and loving God, we offer you these our gifts, the gifts of our hands and our hearts, of our labor and of our love. We offer them to you, O oh God, and ask that you bless them and us as we put them to work in this, your church, in this community, and out into your world. Accept these our gifts, we pray. Amen. Let us remain standing as we join together in singing our closing hymn, In the Bulb There is a Flower. In the bulb there is a flower In the seed an apple tree In cocoons a hidden promise Butterflies will soon be free In the cold and snow of winter There's a spring that waits to be Unrevealed until its season Something God alone can see In the song, in every silence Seeking words There's a dawn for every darkness, bringing hope to you and me. In the past will come the future, what it holds a mystery, unrevealed until it sees it, something God alone can see. In our hand is our beginning, in our time infinity, in our doubt there is believing, in our life eternity, in our death the resurrection, and the lasting victory, unrevealed until And as we go forth from this place, next Sunday, there will be a resurrection with a new battery in this remote. <laughs> so there will be words on the screen. <laughs> as we go forth from this place, let us go forth, not just with hope, but with vulnerability. Let us go forth with a willingness to see the scars and the truths of others, but let us also go forth with a willingness to share our own scars, our own struggles, so that others might be given a chance to offer love and hope. Go in the peace of Christ. Amen. We have a short post